My father was a tireless advocate for the law. He was a criminal prosecutor. Some say ruthless, others say righteous. Yeah, I'm cut from the same cloth. I can't really remember who I was before I became a cop. It's my job to make bad things happen to bad people. It wasn't like Grampy to just stop and disappear. It's a hard thing to think that somebody would do that to someone else. When you're being beat and you're that age, you don't stand much of a chance. There were so many things that just didn't make sense. A Metro Toronto police officer was following up on a tip from a bylaw officer who had tagged a van. Further investigation revealed the body of an elderly man inside. I got a call from my mother. She told me that Grampy was missing. For those nine days, we had no idea what was going on. That waiting time, that I think was the worst. I remember mom getting quite upset and she started to cry. She kind of knew, it just didn't make sense. And this is where they say that uh, daddy was murdered. They took his body out as soon as they could. There could have been a lot more memories made. Why hasn't somebody been brought to justice for murdering Grampy? The circumstances surrounding Clyde's murder are bizarre. Obviously, you have some wonderful memories of your grandfather and your father. What has it been like for you to have him taken away so brutally? It would have been nice to, to have him come home. And Dad was a very soft-hearted person, and he'd do anything for anyone. He would be the last person you would ever expect to yes. end up this way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Home was his sanctuary. He started out with nothing. He was a self-made man, and that at the end of his life, during his golden years, when he's supposed to be enjoying the fruits of his labor, someone invades that space. If you can't feel safe in your own home, where can you feel safe? If push came to shove, get physical, if someone tried to back him into a corner. Yeah, I've never I, seen it. I've never seen yeah. it, but I know he would. He would have put up a fight, yeah. So what we would like is your blessing to take this case on, and right. I think it could benefit from some fresh eyes. I'm agreeable. Yes, very agreeable. I've been a cop and a professor of criminology for years, and I've used that experience to assemble a squad of civilian subject matter experts. They must approach each case completely unbiased, to not box themselves into conventional thinking, to bring fresh eyes and new technologies to the table. Their job, and mine, is to investigate the coldest of cold cases the murders that time forgot. Case number 99-510-291. Clyde Orlando Frost. Facts are as follows. On the evening of January 23rd, 1999, Sometime after 11.30 p.m., 80-year-old Clyde Frost disappears from his middle-class home in the city of Hamilton. The next day, his wife, Gillette, arrives home at approximately 3 a.m. from a late-night flight from Jamaica, where she was visiting her ailing father, and by her account, proceeds directly to bed in a separate bedroom. She wakes up 
sometime in the late morning and discovers that Clyde is missing. His 1995 Dodge conversion van is not in the driveway. She finds this suspicious and reports him missing to police. January 27, 1999, Hamilton police execute a search warrant at the Frost home and discover a stain on the basement carpet that is ultimately determined to be the blood of Clyde Frost, which, by the way, was caused by blunt force trauma to the head. February 2nd, 1999, a Toronto bylaw enforcement officer discovers a stack of parking tickets on the windshield of what seems to be an abandoned conversion van in the city's Regent Park neighborhood. Upon looking in the windows, the bylaw enforcement officer finds a body in the back, a body determined to be that of Clyde Frost. Within 24 hours of Clyde's body being found, police receive an anonymous fax from an author the police describe as having intimate knowledge of Clyde's murder. In the fax, the author describes Clyde's death as having resulted from a ransom kidnapping scheme gone bad. Three men somehow gained access to his home while he was there, but there's no sign of forced entry. A redacted copy of this fax was released to the public, which as you can see is signed sincerely stupid and sorry. Police will frequently suppress information that only the killer or killers would know, what we call holdback information, information that's not publicized and not even widely known outside of an inner circle of lead investigators. And here we are 15 years later, this case still unsolved, still cold. As it turns out, Clyde Frost was worth a fair bit of money. He was a retired long haul truck driver turned landlord and he had amassed a small fortune. Aside from the facts making reference to the ransom scheme, at no point was a ransom demand ever made to the family. Which brings us to the next question, who knew about this small fortune that he had accessible? Recently married, I'm looking at the financial situation. She certainly has an ironclad alibi. Did anyone else live in the house with Clyde and Gillette? Gillette's mother lived in the home as did her two teenage children from a previous relationship. Now we know that the night Clyde disappeared. Gillette's son was away at a sleepover, but her 16-year-old daughter was home, as was Gillette's mother. Sometime after 11.30 p.m., Clyde let three men into the home. Why would you do that unless you knew them? How is it that the grandmother and the daughter never heard three men in the home? Pretty high risk to enter when people are home. It is. Well, to remove the body, no less, not even just to leave him in the basement. As a society, we should be respecting our elders and looking up to them. And for him to have been taken advantage of in such a horrific way is very troubling. When I saw Clyde's picture, I see a vulnerability. I can empathize with the family on what they went through and how they were feeling. I've seen it many times. Uh, money destroy relationships. It can destroy marriages. It's time for fresh eyes, new perspectives, new ideas. I think I want to start with the neighbors and the tenants. Were any of them disgruntled? Had he recently evicted anybody? Being a landlord is a tough business. Then Tanella? I'd like to find out more about Clyde and Gillette's relationship. What were the dynamics of their relationship? The fact that he was newly married to a much younger woman, we have to be careful not to make too many assumptions and look at everybody equally. Dania, what do you got? I want to look at the facts itself. A linguistic expert might tell us more about the perpetrator, perpetrators. Renee? I think we need to learn more about the exact circumstances of Clyde's death. So I'm going to look at the basement. There may be some new forensic techniques that we can use to identify the original bloodstain, any other bloodstain patterns on the walls that could describe the attack that took place. I do like where you're going in terms of looking at the crime scene, assuming the home was the murder site. It will allow us to either validate some of the evidence that's in that fax or discredit it as simply a made-up story. Peter, lastly, you? I'm very interested to see if I can pull out uh, journalistic records of any similar crimes. In terms of victimology, elderly male victims who are killed by strangers, we're talking a very, very small percentage. Do not operate with any preconceived notions or expectations. Come at this using your own expertise, your own experience, and your own insights. This case, for all intents and purposes, starts now. 
motive to me in this case is interesting. On the surface, it seems to clearly be about money. Who wanted it most, and what steps were they prepared to go to to get it? And if they were denied it, what would they do in retaliation? Well, we know what they did is they killed them. The squad of civilian subject matter experts and I are undertaking with fresh eyes an analysis of the 1999 slaying of 80-year-old Clyde Frost, who was murdered in his home in Hamilton, Ontario. We know this crime was all about the money. The question is how much money? Are we talking hundreds, thousands, or hundreds of thousands, up to the million or so dollars Clyde was worth at the end of his life? From the outset, we need to jump in and have a retrospective look at Clyde's business dealings, his intimate relationships, his relationships with his tenants, and the facts behind this purported kidnapping. I've tasked Dania to track down Gillette. The internet and phone books have yielded nothing, so she needs to be creative. I want to find Gillette because she might have some useful information. She knew Clyde. She was Clyde's wife. I'm going to the African hair and beauty supply shop in Hamilton, as we know that Gillette was really into her personal appearance, so we thought it was the most logical place to start. I was actually looking for a woman named Gillette. She used to live in Hamilton around 1998, 1999. No, she doesn't look familiar. Hi. What can I do for you? We're looking for a woman by the name of Gillette. Does that ring a bell? Nope. Her husband was actually murdered back in 1999. He would have been about 79 years old at the time. She was in her 40s. I know who you're talking about. Do you really? I actually do. When that was I... the last time that you saw Gillette? I would say, what, maybe seven, eight years, maybe longer? Mm -hmm. What else do you know about the case? I know there has been a lot of talk among the community as to maybe he was killed and who would want him dead. Did no. they say who? No, I never heard anything about who might it might be. We found somebody who actually knew her, which is really exciting. So fingers crossed moving forward. I'm going to meet Charles Eleveld. He worked for Clyde Frost. Did evictions for him. How are you? Monty. I'm well. What kind of guy was Mr. Frost? What kind of a man was he? Mr. Frost really was a nice guy, and he would help anybody that, that needed help. I see. So you feel people took advantage of Mr. Frost? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did Mr. Frost collect the rent himself? Yeah, he, he did. He would go out on a Saturday and collect the rent. Many times he would have probably two or three thousand dollars worth of cash in his pocket. Because of the way Clyde operated and dealt in cash and carried cash, anyone who knew that information would be worth having a quick look at. So as I go through the documents here, I'm seeing this one particular set of tenants. Were they evicted eventually or? Yes, they were. Do you think they would have held a grudge against Mr. Frost, because of this eviction? No doubt about it. Now, I see another tenant here. Was there an eviction here? There was also an eviction. She was a stripper, and she was involved at the motorcycle club. I was kind of worried about it, especially when I was alone, and uh, there were three or four of them. So, Charles, in your opinion, do you think it's possible that an ex-tenant could be responsible for his death. There were at least some people were interested in, in getting rid of Clyde Frost. So now I've got to track down some of Clyde's former tenants, see if any persons of interest show up. Peter's task was to look for similar crimes in and around the time period where Clyde Frost was kidnapped and murdered. First of all, what we have here is the Frost case, where he was last seen in his home and where he ended up. All right. And here's the new case that I found, Bill Staples. 67-year-old William Staples was found in the rear of Staples' pickup truck. Almost one year to the day prior to uh, the disappearance of Frost, Bill Staples disappeared from his Binbrook home. About six months later, he was found in the back of his own GMC Sonoma pickup. What am I looking at here? Well, I've listed the similarities, and there are quite a few. 
Bill Staples, wealthy retiree, attacked in his own home January 98, murdered, driven in his own vehicle where he's left. Clyde Frost, a year later, wealthy retiree, also attacked in his own home and driven alone in his own vehicle, long distance away, vehicle abandoned on a city street. Both died from blunt force trauma to the head. This is pretty compelling. There seems to be some obvious points in common. I'd be interested to know what the status of this investigation is. Well, it's been unsolved for 10 years and more, and uh, no one's been convicted as of yet. In criminology, we have something called general deterrence theory. People will be dissuaded, deterred from committing crimes if there is a certainty of punishment. Conversely, when crimes of a sensational nature go unsolved, people are getting away with it. People who have half-baked ideas about committing crimes themselves see that there is no consequence. What we can't rule out is the copycat effect. Mm. You have to question the publicity surrounding this Staples case, whether or not it piqued somebody else's curiosity yeah. in trying such a scheme. So we have a few leads to follow up on. This Staples case, on the surface, seems to have a matching MO to Clyde's case. That merits looking into further. Equally, I'm wondering if any of Clyde's tenants had enough of a grudge to go after his money or to kill him. I think that's an interesting thing. <laughs> This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Squad and I are examining the 15-year-old cold case of Clyde Frost, an 80-year-old man who was murdered in his own home, possibly for money, and then dumped over 100 kilometers away in his own vehicle. Despite their lack of direct field experience in this type of work, I'm already impressed with the squad's diligence and their findings. Peter, for instance, has uncovered some disturbing similarities between Clyde's murder and another Hamilton murder just one year prior. Beyond that, Monty's also been able to track down some of Clyde's former tenants, many of whom were in arrears on their payments. Could this have been a motive? My name is uh, Doug Montgomery. Just trying to get a feel for what kind of landlord was he? Personally? I'm sorry, he was, I thought he was a slime ball. Three months after his wife dies, he's looking for somebody to replace her. So he was difficult to get along with in some ways? No, he, as far as our, our business, we got behind our rent. Right. We really went through a couple of years of hard times. There was no talk of us, him throwing us out or anything. He worked with us. In that sense, he was a good person. Right. Quite honestly, I don't think this couple owed him enough money for things to get that carried away. Pretty certain I can rule her out. Well, that was a bit of a strikeout. Uh, it turns out that Clyde actually helped this tenant when times were tough. So now I've got to check out any other tenants with red flags, see what they have to say. Detectives had discovered extensive blood stains inside the family home. The 80-year-old Clyde Frost once called home. Before police could arrive at the scene and confirm that it was Clyde's blood, his family had cleaned the stain, telling police that they thought it was juice. I'm going to the scene where Clyde Frost was murdered with Wade Knapp. He's an expert in analyzing crime scenes and has years of experience using alternate light sources and chemical tests to detect and analyze blood. So Wade, this is the basement where Clyde Frost was murdered. The police later searched the basement and there was a report of a large blood stain pretty close to where we're standing here at the base of the stairs. I'm hoping to find residue of the blood stain. Depending on the pattern of blood, you might be able to reconstruct more about what happened to Clyde. Was he already on the ground when he was struck, producing one single pool of blood? Is there blood spatter on the wall that indicates movement between Clyde and the perpetrators? This will help us verify the details that were included in the fax that was sent. When a suspect is cleaning up after themselves to try and avoid detection, they don't realize how sensitive some of the investigative tools are that we have. So if they can't see that blood, for instance, visible after they've cleaned it up, they assume that there's no trace of it left, and that's just simply not the case. If the materials that absorbed the blood in Clyde's case are still in this house today, we will be able to identify where that blood stain initially was. We use a specific wavelength of light with orange goggles to filter, and that will reveal any traces of blood stain. Wade, what do you think about this dark spot here? 
a stain of some kind. It might be worth investigating. We're going to use an indicator known as hexagon OBTI. So in this case, we've only got one line in the window at C. Although it, we've identified a stain with the light source, it's not human blood. Correct. I was very disappointed that our experimentation in the house today did not reveal any of Clyde's blood. I was hoping that those details might support or refute the details that were written in the facts that was sent by the alleged perpetrators. The other avenue of investigation the squad needs to follow up on is tracking down Gillette and her family. See what they know about the final few hours of Clyde's life. And while we know that Gillette was out of the country when Clyde was murdered, we also know that her mother and her daughter were at home in the same residence where Clyde was murdered, either at the time or immediately thereafter. So where are we at in terms of either finding or talking to Gillette or her family? I've been trying to get in touch with her sons. So we sent a letter to them. They were delivered, they were received. There's been no response. Interesting. Antonella? Well, I was able to talk to Gillette's daughter, Roseanne. OK. Roseanne's version of events is key. She was the one who cleaned up what was later determined to be Clyde's blood in the basement, thinking it was grape juice. The question is, was this an honest mistake, or did someone counsel her to destroy evidence? She was quite disturbed by my call, and I think shaken as well. But she doesn't want to have anything to do with talking to us. It was something she completely discounted. So that would make me think there's a place she doesn't want to go to. As she told me, the assumption was made that because they were black, they might have had something to do with the murder. What if there's fear involved? What if they had nothing to do with it, but somehow know who did? I'm curious why, when presented with an opportunity by an impartial group of experts, why she wouldn't seize that opportunity to come clean with what she knows tell the story that she says no one wanted to listen to almost 15 years ago. Well, here's your chance, so why aren't you taking it? Antonella, I'm going to task you of calling her and passing a definitive message on to Gillette about what we're doing and seeing if she wants to speak to us. So I don't want to say that it's mission impossible, but it's mission improbable. And if there's anyone who can convince Gillette to come on board, my guess is it's Antonella. If you want to get your story out, why wouldn't you speak to us? Because we want to listen. Uh, you know, we want to solve this. Does someone have a hold over Gillette and her family, even to this day? Is someone dissuading them from cooperating? Do they have any connections to Clyde's business dealings? These are precisely the types of questions we need to answer. The civilian squad and I are investigating the cold case of 80-year-old Clyde Frost, a Hamilton landlord most likely murdered for money and left in his own van. Monty has excluded as many of Clyde's problem tenants that he's been able to track down, so now he's widening his search into Clyde's other business dealings, looking for persons of interest. Also, we've been trying to verify a partially censored facsimile that claims that Clyde's death happened because of a kidnapping gone wrong. Antonella has also tracked down Clyde's widow, Gillette, asking her to speak with us, but she's declined. Does she have some knowledge of what happened that night, and is someone pressuring her to keep quiet? to see if I could get some information uh, on a lawyer to try and track him down. I am trying to contact a lawyer that worked for Clyde. Charles, Clyde's eviction officer, told me that this lawyer had persuaded Clyde to invest in a building, and he feels there may have been ill will between the two parties after this deal was done. I'm doing some research on Clyde Frost. And I was wondering if you were the lawyer that worked with him in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada in the 80s and 90s. OK, well, sorry to have bothered you. Bye-bye. There's a lot left to do uh, on the theory that someone who held a grudge against Clyde killed him. We just have to keep looking into it. In the case of Clyde Frost, Peter was tasked with finding commonalities between Clyde's murder and the earlier murder of William Staples. Whoever murdered Clyde Frost may have been not only looking to emulate what happened in the Staples case, but also mask their crime to fit the M.O. of the Staples case. In 1999, there was no named suspect. 
In 2010, there was an arrest, and the case is still being tried. We now know enough to rule out any connection to Clyde's case. We've hit a wall on this. There's nowhere else to go with the Staples case. As investigators, we're taking unconventional approaches, so we're bound to get some false positives or some red herrings. All right, I'll check back for the info. You bet. Antenna has come up against nothing but brick walls in her search for Clyde's widow and her daughter, who we know was in the house either at the time or immediately after Clyde was murdered. While that's disappointing, there's a witness, a resident from the neighborhood who has come forward and has some information he wants to share. Mr. Frost, of course, lived here. Alan Ford was a neighbor of Clyde's. He lived right next door. Actually, his bedroom window faced into Clyde's driveway. What I hope to find out from Alan is what he saw that day of Clyde's murder and anything else he thinks might be relevant in our investigation. So, Alan, tell me about the day of the murder. There was some activity around Clyde's van. There were at least three people moving around the van at that time, none that I would recognize. Can you describe them to me at all? One fellow had a hat on, and it looked like the back van door was open and, and that um, they were making plans to put something in it. I kind of hope that this brings some resolution to Clyde's family. He deserved better than what happened. What do you think happened to Clyde? I was um, pretty shaken by it. I'm going to leave it at that. Meeting the people that knew Clyde, you can see there's a lot of collateral damage. Alan did cooperate. There were people hanging around Clyde's van the day after his murder. Could they be connected to the Regent Park area of Toronto? Where his body was found in this van. And could it be people that the family knew? I'm going to meet with Ron Retham, who's a retired member of the Toronto Police. He worked in Regent Park area extensively over his career, and he was also on the scene the day that Clyde's body was found. He has detailed insights into not only the crime scene itself, but the surrounding neighborhood. We can safely say that the van was parked right outside yep. that window right there. Take me through maybe the mindset of whoever decided to deposit mm -hmm. this van on, to dump Clyde Frost's body on. Why this street, why this neighborhood? Did the person that was driving that van, did he not really know the area, panicking, just came up here and dumped it? Maybe it had nothing to do with the neighborhood and it was just a matter of logistics. Would you expect a killer to leave a body kind of in their own backyard or so close to home? Not usually from, okay. from my experience. To be from Regent Park, go to Hamilton and, and commit a murder and then right. bring the body back here with you, I, I you know, anything's possible. Not only uh, did they deposit the body here, but then they make reference to this neighborhood by name in the facts subsequently sent to the police. The question now is what that fax has to do with why the body was left here. Kind of looks like it's been written by somebody that knows what they're talking about. Well, it looks to me like these two kids, if you will, were hired to do something. That's your hunch? That, that's, I mean, just from reading that, yeah. it, it looks to me like there was a bad debt and these two were sent to, to help get that debt. And it went bad. And it went bad. One question you can't help but ask when you see a home invasion gone bad, especially really bad, as in Clyde's case, is whether Clyde had some financial problems that few people knew about, or if he was somehow connected to somebody who had their own financial problems and he was put in the middle. Either way, the squad needs to dig deeper and these questions merit looking into. The civilian squad of subject matter experts and I are looking into the cold case of 80-year-old Clyde Frost, a well-off Hamilton landlord probably murdered for money and left in his own van. Through the squad's work, we have learned that a facsimile sent by the perpetrators indicates that Clyde's murder likely resulted from a kidnapping gone wrong. One of the original investigators on the case thought that maybe somebody was calling in a bad debt or robbing Clyde simply to pay back a bad debt. Clyde's widow, Gillette, and her family have declined to speak with us, and there are many unanswered questions that still linger. Is this family still in fear of the killers? Who may have owed money? Was it Clyde or was it somebody else?
Daniel requested documents from the courthouse on Clyde Frost's will and any other information surrounding this case. Gillette Anesta Frost, she was named sole beneficiary and trustee. Okay, let's take a look at this indictment here. So what I'm seeing is that Gillette paid restitution for welfare fraud. Oh, really? She got, it says six months imprisonment, but she served 16 days and she had to do uh, community hours. Oh, she had house arrest too. Wow. This cast Clyde's widow Gillette in a different light. These documents reveal she did prison time for welfare fraud and had significant gambling debts. She was told to get counseling and treatment and go to Gamblers Anonymous. Or... She had gambling debts in excess of $100,000. And the question here is, where'd she get that money, right? Could there be a connection between the person or people who murdered Clyde and whoever sent that facsimile to the police, admitting that this was a botched kidnapping? Or is there a chance that they were collecting on a bad debt owed by Gillette? This is information I need to get to the squad right away. I'm calling the Frost family to ask them about their insights into Gillette and Clyde's marriage. What kind of relationship did your grandfather have with Gillette? He seemed like he wanted more, maybe more attention, and he wanted to be more like closer to her than what she seemed to want to be to him. How did uh, Gillette and your grandfather, uh, father meet? She used to rent from my father. Mm-hmm. And that's how they met. Did she ever mention anything about the relationship in terms of intimacy? He said he should get an annulment. And I said, well, if you aren't happy, I said, maybe you should. Before he was married, who were the beneficiaries in the will? That would be uh, myself and my sister Diane and my sister Virginia. And after the marriage? Gillette. After speaking with the Frost family, it's obvious that they were concerned about Gillette and Clyde's relationship. They didn't think he was very happy. He had concerns. People need to lean this out and figure out what exactly this information is telling us. And it's telling me, find Gillette and find out what her story is. Then you follow me to the smart board if you could. Despite what we're learning about Gillette, it's important to not get boxed into a theory and to explore all avenues of investigation open to us. There's still the lingering question about that bizarre facsimile sent to police. There's no doubt that contained in that document are some key answers. So one thing that's been nagging at me is this bizarre facsimile. It seems to me that this is a really rich source of evidence. The narrative in this facsimile lays out a scenario where three individuals attended Clyde Frost's home the intent is to kidnap him and extort his family for half a million dollars. They seem to be satisfied with the fact that Clyde had $5,000 in his wallet and they were prepared to leave with that. Clyde then tells them he has more money in the basement and he lures these three into the basement. But presumably Clyde is looking to either detain these men or otherwise subdue them for the authorities. And the author describes he and the accomplice known as B as trying to hold back or restrain C who it reads like delivered the fatal blow and actually murdered Clyde. These redactions, as we call them, these sensor marks where everything has been blacked out, this makes it very difficult to genuinely analyze this document using forensic linguistics. It doesn't rule out psychological analysis. I've got someone in mind I'd like you and Renee to meet with. Danny and I are going to be interviewing Jim Van Allen. He has decades of experience working with the provincial police to try and really piece together what is the mindset of the perpetrator. What can we learn based on what was written in the facts and how that compares to the details of the crime itself? Even though a lot of the information is blacked out on the facts, Jim can help us decipher the actual contents that we can see. Do you think this was a kidnapping gone wrong? I don't really believe it was a kidnapping gone wrong. I believe that the victim was targeted. The staged kidnapping is an intent to deflect suspicion away from 
the people that are involved in. In the wording of the letter, it sort of says, we were going to ask for a ransom, but then as the letter progresses, it says, this isn't something we decided until later. It seems to be written with a number of choices and even their emotions are undecided, I think, as indicated by the question marks that uh, appear throughout the letter. And a stranger would not move that body, that would have no need to move that body. The offender would choose to move the body because they fear that they can be associated to either the victim or a location that the crime happened. There could be the involvement of uh, female authorship as well. Why do you say that? We see differences in letters and emails written by men and women. Uh, women tend to include emotional terms. It tends to be more conversational, and that's uh, some of the features that I see in this letter. Are there any red flags that based on your years of experience are raised? One of the other things I noticed in the letter as well was uh, where the authors are suggesting that somebody is willing to confess and then likely serve a sentence and then leave the country suggests the possibility that one of the offenders might be foreign born. So I would categorize this case as a staged kidnapping of an elderly targeted victim for a profit motivation and a subsequent cover-up by people who were somehow acquainted or associated with the victim. What kind of hit home was the fact that he said that the person or the culprits was associated with Clyde in some respect. Our squad has repeatedly tried to contact the family members trying to get their perspective of the story and the lack of cooperation, the cleaning up of um, the blood. Those kind of things just are not consistent with a family, a grieving family who's just dealt with losing a loved one. In investigating the 1999 murder of wealthy senior Clyde Frost, the civilian squad of non-professional detectives has learned that the killers were possibly connected to the victim. Money was the motive, whether calling in a bad debt, a botched robbery, or attempting a kidnapping when things went out of control and Clyde was killed. There's one loose end remaining, that Clyde's death was the result of a grudge born from a business deal gone wrong. I've tasked Monty with following that up. Charles Eleveld, Clyde's eviction officer, told me about Cass, Clyde's former lawyer, and I finally found him. I want to see what he has to say about Clyde's business affairs at the time. I had a few questions for you about Clyde Frost. Do you remember when you first met him? It was probably in the uh, 60s or 70s. He became a client of mine in connection with real estate transactions. And can you remember when the last deal you were involved with him was? Well, it had to be before 1979. Before 79? Because I stopped practicing law in 1979. Because I got into trouble myself. Well, when you stopped practicing law? I was charged with fraud and uh, theft, and uh, I served a six-year uh, sentence. Just the way Henry came across, with absolutely nothing to hide. I don't know how Charles got the idea that Clyde and Henry had difficulty, especially since we can't find any evidence of the, the two men doing any business post-1979. Perhaps Charles just feels so badly about what happened to his old friend that maybe he's looking for something that wasn't there. I think we do that sometimes. The 1999 murder of Clyde Frost. A lot of roadblocks, a lot of impediments during the course of our investigative analysis. But we did make some headway. So, Monty, I'm gonna go to you first. People like to speculate about the theory that Clyde had left a trail of angry tenants in his wake and maybe one of them held a grudge. I exhausted, you know, just about every avenue. I don't think there's any merit to that idea, that theory. He would actually let tenants stay on when they were unable to pay rent and let them pay as they were able. Peter, over to you. So I delved into geospatial statistics uh, for violent crimes in Hamilton, specifically homicides and break and enters. It turns out that the San Pedro area of Hamilton is one of the safest and most affluent in the city. So this isn't bleed over from neighborhood turf wars or part of a larger pattern of 
home invasion break and enters. This right. is really an anomaly. Antonella? After many phone calls, emails, social media, and letters sent by courier, we were unable to get information interviews from Clyde's inner circle, which include his widow, his two stepchildren that lived in the house. Basically a strikeout. Renee? The culprits are most likely associated with either the address or Clyde's family, or possibly both. We also know that the person who wrote the facts was a woman. This crime was not perpetrated by a stranger. No question that Clyde Frost was specifically targeted. The question then is how much money? Whether whoever did this was after the full estate, this million dollars or so in assets and properties, or just the cash in Clyde's hand. That's the one thing at this point we cannot answer, is what was Clyde's life worth to whoever did this? We've got something here to turn over to the authorities. We certainly have something to turn over to Clyde's family who's been waiting for answers now for over 10 years. This case was purely about greed, whoever did this. Given the degree of physical evidence that should have been present both in Clyde's basement and in his van, it's very frustrating that no one was ever charged or caught for the murder of Clyde Frost. The squad can take this case no further, and the police have received our research and analysis. So, after re-examining Clyde's case, there was no evidence to suggest that his death was committed at the hands of any of his tenants, anyone he knew through his business dealings. All evidence points to the fact that whoever did this is affiliated with the family that was living in that house. And again, this goes back to the truthfulness of that facsimile, and we recruited some outside experts to look at that fax. And the general consensus is whoever authored that, if they weren't directly involved, have direct, intimate knowledge of what happened. And I don't think they were prepared for an 80-year-old man being as tough as he was, and things escalated very quickly. Right. And one of them took the extra step of murdering him. I think that person should come clean because for one thing it's got to be weighing heavily on the conscience yes. we get some relief ourselves, and you know we'd like to see justice done for grampy he deserves that my guess is whoever wrote that would still want to come clean about that and at this point re-releasing that facsimile that they wrote in an unredacted form is the best way to reignite that sense of guilt that was gnawing on their conscience during those early days. I feel that this person that sent the facts, if they felt that guilty, then they must have been maybe close to him. Thank you for allowing us to explore this case further. I'm confident this case remains more solvable than ever. Therefore, our report going forward to the police will reflect the fact that this case should be reopened and should be reopened with the view that a narrowed pool of suspects should include people immediately known to Clyde, and that distills this down to a very small group of people. You've been very brave, and we need more people like you who are prepared to do this if we're going to get these cases solved, these older cases in particular. So thanks again. Yes.